morning! Welcome to First Chinese Baptist Church of Dallas. We hope that you have a great morning so far. If this is your first time joining us for worship, we would love it if you could fill out the contact form linked in the description box below so we could better connect you with our local community groups. You can also join us through Zoom as we watch the service together every Sunday. If you need that link, feel free to contact us in the form as well. We hope you have a great time worshiping together with us. Good morning, church. Welcome to Worship with SBC Dallas. My name is Pastor Dylan. I'm so glad that you could join us for worship this morning. I pray that this morning will be a great time for you to worship God together with us as a church and really just be encouraged by His Word and be sent out into this week. Um, so having learned something new with new things to meditate on. Before we start and continue with our worship service this morning, I just have a few announcements for us. First is that on the 24th of this month, we're having a special congregational meeting. We're going to be voting on the associate Chinese pastor position. So if you're a church member, come on out uh, and vote. Make your voice heard because this uh, is important for our church. So I invite you to join and take part of this process. Secondly, you might have been hearing about different service opportunities that we've been having the past few weeks and the past few months. Well, we're going to make it a regular thing for us here. We're going to call it a second Saturday service. So on the second Saturday of every month, we're going to be going down to partner with Our Calling, which is a homeless ministry in downtown Dallas. This is a great opportunity for us to serve together as a church and really just to care for those in need in our own community. So if you're interested in learning more about that, contact me or contact Spencer, our outreach coordinator. We can get you more info and get connected so that we can just serve together as a church. Thirdly, we're actually launching a new group starting on February 2nd. We're making a group for young families, young parents, where this will be a time for you to connect and really encourage each other and share and build a deep Christian community that way. This is designed for young parents who are busy. And so we'll be you know, accommodating different things where you know, moms who meet on certain weeks, dads who meet on certain weeks, those kinds of things. And if you're not already part of a community group and you fit in this group of young parents and young families, I invite you um, just to consider it and check it out. You can contact me or contact Julie, who will be the point person for that. And yeah, it's, it's really great just to see as we're entering into 2021, there are new ministry opportunities, new ways to serve, new ways to connect with people in the church. And so now we just have to go and check those out. So before we continue with our worship service this morning, let's pray. Just ask God and prepare our hearts so we can receive his word and his message this morning. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this morning that we can come and worship you. We always thank you uh, for this opportunity that we hear from your word. We can sing praises to you, God, and that this is a time where we can be built up as your followers, as your family. Would you use this morning um, to prepare us for the things that we have to face this week? And in the midst of you know, a lot of difficult things going on in the world and probably in our own lives as well. Would you just remind us of your truth, your goodness, and your faithfulness, God? Help us to be obedient to you and your calling in our lives. Help us to love those around us, our family, our co-workers, our friends. Help us just to reflect you in your light, God. So be with us this morning. Prepare us, open our hearts to hear uh, fully from you. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Say 
Church, thank you so much for joining us this morning. I'm Pastor Paul. I'm the youth pastor here at FCBC Dallas. Uh, if you're joining us for the first time, we want to welcome you. We're glad that you're worshiping with us this morning. Uh, we would love to um, for you to fill out the uh, contact form for us. Uh, we would love to connect with you. Uh, the link is in the description below. Uh, today we're going to continue with our sermon series called Encounters with Jesus. Last week we looked at a passage from Luke chapter 2 where it is the only passage really uh, recorded the childhood of Jesus, the only record of Jesus growing up. And today we're going to fast forward a little bit uh, to the time when Jesus called his 12 disciples. Uh, this is also known as the calling of the 12. Uh, we'll be looking at a couple different passages. Uh, one is Mark 3 and then the other one is Matthew 10. So obviously uh, our focus this morning is the calling of the 12, but just as Jesus called his 12 disciples, uh, he has also called you and me. So keep that in mind as we go through God's word this morning uh, together. Uh, let me pray for us and then we'll get started and dive into today's passage. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for you, uh, the gift of your word. And as we think on, on these things, uh, open our hearts and open our minds uh, uh, to hear you, uh, to teach us where we need to be taught, um, to rebuke us uh, where we need to be rebuked, uh, correct us where we need to be corrected, and train us where we need to be trained. And uh, so we commit this time to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So if you have your Bible, turn with me to Mark chapter 3. We'll be looking at verses 13 to 19. It says, Jesus went up on the mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed twelve that they may be uh, with him, and that he might send them out to preach, and to have authority to drive out demons. These are the twelve he pointed. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, 
James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, to them he gave them the name Boanerges, which means sons of thunders. Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Here we really uh, come to a listing of all the disciples, and we, and and when we think about the twelve disciples, typically if you have any kind of background in the church or any kind of background, maybe in Catholic Church or uh, Anglican Church, uh, or you have been to Europe, or you have. Uh, you have seen uh, a cathedral, you have seen the stained glass of the apostles. They are typically elevated in a way somewhere just below God, just below Jesus, or in some very um, prominent place because the assumption is that these are the highest and the best and the classiest uh, and the most uh, religious ascended of all Christian leaders. Nothing could be farther from the truth here. Uh, they are not that spiritual. They are not uh, nearly divine. Uh, they are not the cream of the crop among men. They are not the highest or noblest or, or uh, the best. They are not the most educated, the, the most highly skilled, the most gifted, humanly speaking. The truth is that they, they basically are distinguished by one thing, and that is they are ordinary. They are just ordinary people. They have that in common. Otherwise, they are a strange group of men. They are a very, very strange group, uh, in my opinion. You couldn't put them together any other way than God doing it for His purposes because of their uh, divergence. This reminds us we don't have to be perfect. While as many as seven of them might be, might have been fishermen, you might have gotten seven guys together on the common ground, right? The other are so different in the things that they did. Uh, we know for sure uh, four of them uh, are fishermen and that uh, there would be no reason to collect these men together, no reason for them to come together, live together, work together, and minister together apart from the purposes of God. Take a look at how uh, they were called by Jesus in Matthew 4. It says, Now as Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. I want you to know this. Jesus said to these two sets of brothers, he said, follow me. And what happened? It says, immediately they left their nets and followed, followed him. They left their boat and their father and followed him. They didn't say, you know what? Let me catch more fish first then I will follow you, Jesus. They didn't say, you know, let me work more and, and get a bigger boat or a better boat first, or let me take care of my father, my parents first, and then I'll follow you. They are perfectly ordinary men in every way. Not one of them, right, uh, is renowned for scholarship or public speaking. None of them had a track record as some kind of theologian. Basically, they were outsiders, total outsiders from the religious establishment of Jesus' day. They didn't have any particular natural talents. They don't appear to have any particular intellectual talents. They weren't highly educated. They were, on the other hand, prone to mistakes, misjudgments, and misunderstanding and bad attitudes and lapses of faith. Uh, they are argumentative and no more so than their, their leader, Peter. And Jesus said that they were slow learners. They were spiritually dense. They didn't know what's going on most of the time. And locational, uh, location wise, 
Uh, they, they were virtually all from Galilee, with the exception of Judas, who was really the only outsider, a total stranger. They grew up, um, the rest of them, they grew up in the, in the same basic area, even common towns like Bethsaida or Capernaum, and they may well have known each other as they were growing up um, as, a, as a kid. Uh, you know, it's kind of like a lot of you guys uh, grew up here in North Texas or even Plano, Frisco area. People know each other and may have heard of each other or, or known for something, right? Something like uh, maybe you're uh, very good at academic or for a sports that you play or maybe all region in band or orchestra or choir or like being a great worship leader like our worship leader Daniel. Um, you know, people know each other, right, in the, within the same area. And in their case, they would have known each other as not distinguished men by any means at all. They had faults, uh, character flaws, and from a human perspective, and if you think about this, the whole extension of the kingdom of God in advancing the gospel to the whole world depends upon them. And there is no plan B. There's no second string. There's no backup squad. They're it. And yet, these are the same men who carried on a ministry after Jesus ascended into heaven that totally turned the world upside down. What did they do? Or what did they have to do? Right? In, in Mark chapter 3, only said in verse 14, He appointed twelve that they might be with Him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. Mark really didn't say much here, but Matthew does in Matthew 10, and that's why we're going to hop over to Matthew a little bit. Uh, and Matthew 10 recorded the specific instructions that Jesus gave as he sent out the 12. Look at Matthew 10. If you have your Bible, turn with me. We'll begin in verse 5. These 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the law sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Do not get any gold or silver or copper to take with you in your belts. No bag for the journey or extra shirt or sandals or a staff, for the worker is worth his keep. Whatever town or village you enter, search there for some worthy person and stay at their house until you leave. As you enter the home, give it your greeting. If the house is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If it is not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet. Truly, I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. I am sending you out like sheep among wolves, therefore, as true as snakes and as innocent as doves. Be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and be flocked in the synagogues. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say. For it will not be you speaking, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Here in Matthew 10, Jesus specifically tells them not to go to the Gentiles yet, right? Not that Jesus doesn't uh, love the Gentiles or he is playing favorites, but be it is because uh, there was still much had to be accomplished or done in Israel itself up until the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. Only after the Pentecost, um, would the Christian mission extend among the Gentiles and the Samaritans. But for now, focus, Jesus said, focus on the lost sheep of Israel. Jesus said in verse 7, As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. 
In other words, Jesus called us to follow him and we're, we're, we're to participate in the kingdom of God. And this is the character of Jesus' ministry. It is a ministry of preaching and of healing. And it is a ministry of compassion and sacrifice. In essence, Jesus is uh, taking the work he has been doing and transferring and uh, sharing that power to his followers. And I don't know about you, but do you remember the first time your parents handed you the car keys? Well, I, I learned how to drive from my dad. And at the time, we weren't wealthy. We only had one car, and it was a 19-year-old uh, Ford Granada. Uh, this car went from zeros to 60 like no other. It wasn't like 10 seconds. It wasn't 15 seconds. It wasn't 20 seconds. But it was like more, more like eventually it would get to 60. Um, it was a difficult car to drive because it feels like a boat. Uh, the alignment was off. Uh, you have to keep both hands on the steering wheel at all times. Otherwise, it will start drifting on one side uh, of the car. Um, the first time I was behind the wheel uh, was in a big empty park, uh, parking lot. Uh, my dad showed me a few basic uh, or basics and, and then he said, okay, your turn. And I was like, really? You know, uh, I mean, can I watch you for a few more years? Um, but anyhow, so I slipped into the, the driver's seat and put both of my feet on the uh, brake pedals. Um, trust me, I mean, you, you have to do that uh, with old cars like that. So, you know, so, so anyway, slowly I let go of the brakes and uh, slipped my right foot into the gas pedal and then uh, off we go. And that was my experience driving uh, for the first time. But here's the thing, in a similar way, Jesus just handed the car keys to the disciples and to you and to me as well so that we can participate in the kingdom of God. Jesus tells us to, uh, to travel light. Look at verse 9 uh, that, and the following. It says, Do not get any gold or silver or copper to take with you in your belt. No bag for uh, the journey or extra shirt or sandals or a staff for the worker is worth his keep. Whatever town or village you enter, search there for some worthy person and stay at their house until you leave. As you enter their home, uh, give it your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If it is not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet. Truly, I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. Basically, he said, travel light. Don't take gold or sil no silver, no copper, no bag, no extra tunic, no sandals, no staff. You definitely won't be paying any check baggage fees um, because they have no nothing. They have nothing. But instead, rely on the kindness of strangers to care for you along the journey. You know, when you think about this, doesn't it seem strange and odd? If the goal is to get people's attention, right? To attract potential followers, right? When you think about this, shouldn't they roll into town with a little more flair? Uh, maybe a, you know, maybe riding in a tour bus, speakers blaring and uh, apostles throwing candy out of the window and they could put up yard signs and hand out bumper stickers, broadcasting some negative ads against the surrounding pagan religions. Instead, instead, they are to arrive in town as inconspicuous as possible, armed with nothing but the good news, the gospel, which is why they were sent in the first place. You know, honestly, as a pastor myself, I struggle with this more than ever before, uh, especially since COVID and since the church went online. There's this tug of war internally on how we are to put our online worship together. 
making it look good, attractive, making it interesting for people to watch, to join us, to worship God together so people would come and they would come back week after week. But on the other hand, you know, I'm asking myself, isn't the gospel powerful enough? Isn't God's word alone powerful enough to draw people closer to him? Isn't God's word uh, powerful enough to keep people uh, thirsty enough to come back week after week? Then I ask myself, why all the fancy lighting? Why the high def uh, videos and amazing graphics and transition between the scenes and between, between the different speakers and worship leaders, right? Constantly, I ask myself, Am I trying to please men or am I trying to please God? And the answer is obvious, but it is a struggle nonetheless. But back to the passage, back to the passage. Jesus knew that some people would be receptive to the message, offering them food and a place to stay, but others wouldn't be uh, so hospitable, uh, slam doors instead of a, a warm meal and a comfy bed. But Jesus' words here are so comforting. If you think about this, he says what? He says, if you find a house that is worthy, set up camp there and share your peace. But if anyone will not welcome you or listen to you or listen to your words, shake the dust off your feet as you leave. What Jesus does here is astounding when you think about this because he is basically giving permission to not to fulfill their mission. He is saying to them, it is okay to fail or it is okay not to finish because the success of their work is not completely up to them. If they are rejected, they are to simply move on. I think this is so applicable in our day today. Uh, I've seen so many people on social media or Facebook, uh, different Facebook conversations where people try to model what they have learned from Jesus about being compassionate, loving, and gracious, only to find that the other person on, on the other side only wants to shout louder to prove that they are right and you are wrong. And our human tendency is to shout back and how wrong they are, uh, of course, with love. But what Jesus says here is this, this is not your fight, so don't make it yours. You are done or, or you have done uh, what, you, what you're called to do. Uh, sometimes the most Christian-like or Christ-like thing we can do is to walk away from a discussion that is pulling us in the wrong direction. Right? If someone wants to bully rather than uh, dialogue, shake the dust off. If someone wants to yell at you rather than talk to you, shake the dust off. If someone wants to only, or if someone only interested in talking and not listening, shake the dust off. Right? Better for us to walk away rather than becoming someone we're not called to be. And shake the dust off. So again, God is calling us to follow him, right? He reminded us uh, we don't have to be perfect. And secondly, we are to participate in the kingdom of God. And lastly, uh, here we are, the last point, we are empowered by the spirit of God to do the work. Look at verse 16 with me and the following. It says, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrew as snake and as innocent as doves. Be on your guard and you will be handed over to the local councils and be flocked in the synagogues. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking but the spirit of your father speaking through you. You know, here Jesus dismisses any romantic notion of what it means to be his follower. His people may be uh, like sheep, but they are like sheep among wolves. 
and constantly harassed and endangered. For that reason, they need to be aware of a couple of things. And first, their approach to others needs to be a combination of wisdom and innocence. We need to be wise, right? We need to be wise as serpents. And yet combining it with the innocence of doves. And secondly, we need to be realistic with regards to uh, the way in which others will treat us. We are reminded that we will be placed in difficult places and situations. But here's the thing. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about what to say or how to say it. Because why? Because Jesus reminds us that something very important here, that is, it will not be you speaking, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. And this gives us so much confidence because the Spirit of the Father would speak to and through us at the necessary moment, even if we are not prepared with a statement. And this certainly makes living out Colossians 4, 6 much easier. If you remember Colossians 4, 6, it says this, Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. So what did we learn today? Right? We went through a couple passages. What, what did we learn today? Jesus recruited 12 students. He trained them for three years, put them to the test, 11 passes and one failed. And then commissioned them to do what they were groomed to do. His recruitment of the 12 was one of a kind. No resume was submitted. No interview conducted. Just a simple call. Come follow me. And with that, with the help of the Spirit of God, lives were changed and lives kept on changing ever since. And that's the power of discipleship. It doesn't stop with one generation. It doesn't impact just one generation. Instead, its influence goes way beyond one generation. We can testify to that because we are now 2,000 plus years away from the day Jesus spoke those words. And we're still talking about it, making disciples, right? We're still calling people to follow Christ because these simple words have been passed on from generations to generations. And we are called to follow Christ. We are called followers of Christ. And we are now calling people to follow Christ. Some of you might know that I love fishing. And a few months ago, if I remember correctly, a few months ago, I took my kids fishing and they did pretty well, actually. Uh, and this reminds me of a story I once heard. A story about a guy who loved to go fishing, but he hated to catch fish. The problem was, when, you know, he, he went fishing to relax and catching fish would ruin his relaxation. Uh, since he had to take the fish off the hook and uh, trying to figure out what to do with it, right? And when when he wanted to relax, um, when he wanted to relax by doing nothing, and people thought that he was lazy. And but if he went fishing, he could relax all he wanted because people would see him sitting by the river bank, and they would they would say like, "Oh, look, he is fishing. Don't bother him." So he had the perfect solution. So he would uh, take a fishing pole um, and with a fishing line in it and a bobber. Um, but he would not put a hook at the end of the line. He would cast out the bobber in the water and lay back at the bank, just kind of chilling, uh, looking at the, the thing floating in the water. And to him, that was relaxing to him. Right. Um, that's the way he relaxed. I mean, he could relax all he wanted and he would not be bothered by neither man or fish. Similarly, here's the thing. A lot of Christians are like this man in, in the story. They have their fishing poles uh, propped up line and bobber in the water, but there is no hook at, at the end of the line. 
They are not fishing. They are just relaxing. Do you think this is what Jesus had in mind when he said, come and follow me and I will make you fishers of men in Matthew 4, 19? There have been so many people coming to our church because they say, um, we are here because this is a church that is reaching out to the community. They, they want to be identified with a church that is serious about making a difference for the kingdom of God uh, for, or for the kingdom in the community. And, uh, but they never become a part of any of the ministries or of the church. They don't become a part of the outreach ministry personally. And they have a bobber floating um, on the water, but they have no hook. They're not going to catch any fish. And Jesus said, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. If it was true then, it is true now. So often we are glad that we are safe, that we forget that there are others in danger who need us to become those who reach out. Right? Jesus parting words to his disciples re-emphasize his call in Matthew 28, 19 to 20, which is the Great Commission. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Keep in mind, these men are not the explanation for the advancing of the gospel. They were basically available. They were empowered. And the gospel went over the whole world and continues to do so as a legacy to their faithfulness. Just as Jesus called his disciples, he is calling you to do the same. Follow me, he said. Would you answer his call this morning? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your good and gracious word to us this morning. Thank you that you can even use us at all who are so unqualified thank you for the example that you sent these 12 call them and use them to change the world and we are the fruit generations later of their obedience god we pray also that there may be generations ahead who will be the fruit of our obedience send us lord as you choose Help us to focus on that ministry you have gifted us to do and to make the message crystal clear. We thank you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you again for joining us this morning. We're so glad that you, were, you, you, you get to worship with us. Uh, may God bless you. Uh, have a great week. We, uh, we'll see you again next time. Bye-bye.